database or when you are um, trying to store data in a certain form, like in a more, what are the factors that you consider? Um, I think how the data are related with each other is one aspect. Yeah, that's very correct. Anyone want to add? So has anyone, um, is anyone familiar about uh, normal forms, you know, ball or star schema, data vault, or any other form that helps them design or see data and why, why that is useful? Like, you know, why do people, you know, what is relational versus non-relational, for example? That's another type of model, right? You know, how do you decide to store your data in relational versus non-relational? What, what, what factors do you... you... You don't have to be expert. You don't have to know much. If you have an idea, you can, but if you don't have an idea, you can also ask questions. You know? Even if you might not know what I like, you know, you don't, you, you may not be able to contribute on this discussion in the in the form of providing descriptions or insights. But if you have also questions to add on top of that, you know, or that makes the question more easier accessible, you can also ask. Okay, Okay, thank you so much. Uh, relational database is uh, the type of database which is stored data in the form of uh, rows and the column. Is uh, you can call that a relational database. So uh, a relation in a relational database is uh, uh, literally a table. Table is called a relation. A relation in a relational database, uh, and the non-relational database is. Uh, object oriented data database or object database is there we can store uh, uh, several objects as it is in a database in a non-relational database uh, when we back to the normalization concept we can normalize our uh, uh, database during the design of the database in order to reduce uh, or in order to keep the integrity of data and in order to reduce the data duplication <laughs> Okay. okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so I think uh, sorry, like I was, uh, my attention got a little bit uh, stolen. So, can you say it again? Just sorry. Sure, I can. Uh, a relational database is a type of database which is stored data in the form of uh, a relation or a tabular format. Uh, we can call a relation a, a table in a, a relation in a relational database. So uh, when we say relational, a database is going to store in a tabular format uh, any data. Then a relational database is a kind of uh, object-oriented database, uh, which can store objects or data as an object instead of uh, a relational one or instead of tabular one. You can store data as an object. And the other concept is normalization concept. We can normalize our uh, database design during the uh, design of the database. And uh, uh, the use of normalization is uh, to keep the integrity of the data and to uh, uh, reduce uh, anomalies in a data and to reduce the redundancy of the data in a database. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, that's very correct. I mean, maybe it's very compressed. So. Um, maybe just people can ask questions around each of them. So including, you know, object stores, like I think Shatu uh, just mentioned a number of uh, concepts packed together. So, but does anyone understand? So for example, whatever they heard, can they repeat? Or what are the questions like now 
from all the statement, what are the things that people are not clear about? I mean, for me, tutorials, sometimes I, I use them as a co-studying. You know, it's not, it's a co, like somehow an active session of engagement. Of course, if it was a demo, demo part, then it's fine. Like, you know, I will demo and then I will share. But this one is much more a discussion. This is theory. And so in theory, a lot more, uh, it's question based. So just so that you know, if you are expecting me to share slides or I think that part will not happen now. What happens is that you will ask a question, I will ask a question, and we try to figure out, okay, I don't, I, I actually don't understand that. And one person will probably from here have worked on that, would explain, and then I would explain, goes on like that. So, and anyone rephrase or understand actually what was, what Chetu has uh, explained. I mean, because they're, I think I imagine you have a background, either you teach the course or uh, who have had worked on it, right? Okay, so I think I mean, is that is that in the afternoon, or should I just be naming names? Uh, Rudolf, um, Kedro, Deravolt, Star Schema, Deravese Normalization, good start. Uh, okay, so sorry that there are people who are also writing actually in the. Yeah, so I think the the we will talk Rudolf, about these different parts um, and the data models by Hussein was uh, a learned refined structure for storing using manipulating our data fitting our needs very succinct uh, description true but what what you know in a, in, to take this one in a practical way what are if you could write or speak as well Hussein you know what do you need like in a way that's exactly the purpose um, but what you know what are the the kind of key other ideas that you need to try to take that lesson um, and and concept and design let's say uh, this week's like to choose for example which one to to do for example if you are uh, your if you have your own startup and you want to build your database data warehouse you know and or you know which one do you choose data lake data warehouse um, or within that also what are the kind of concepts you do. So if you if people can add on that, uh, Yerusalem was saying it's designing a database and managing how to store it, absolutely. But again, it's the, of course, the, the word designing a database is what we are talking, how to, to decide, how to design a database. Of course, we are designing it and we need management, of course, just basically entire Discipline is there in in managing databases. Um, you know, it's kind of especially in bank environments, you really need to be very, you know, it has to have like a certain um, redundancy, a certain security, and all of that. So that is correct. From uh, okay, and so anyone else? What what other concept you know? What do you need? So how do you take one moment? Sorry, I'm back. Um, yeah. Anyone else? 
It's gonna be fun session. Yep, it was so it stopped now or at least reduced. So I don't think you hear it to say it anymore. So, so who can tell me what what data models they used last week? And sometimes it's easier to talk, but until we we get to the how do you actually think data models and how do you incorporate them in your day to day? Or you know, I mean, you must have questions, right? If you don't have questions. That means so there there could be two things. One is that you don't have question because you don't. Have you don't also have then in that you know anything you just uh, let me know at least that one and the other one is you know everything so you don't have question or you are you don't you didn't have coffee or you it's an afternoon therefore you are also just like trying to listen and that one is not gonna happen Abraham uh, so <laughs> I was just thinking about what uh, should to say it and uh, is there any way uh, where uh, we can change uh, we can exchange information between two kind of databases mm. I think that's that's for example a good point so maybe out of here who knows how database works then that would also somehow help a little bit just to talk about how relational databases you know, mysql or you know what are the key components because we usually use them as a software we install them and then we add you know we create a database inside them and then inside that we create tables schemas and you know all that but what is in the background can someone explain? Or, or in another sense, does anyone know like this crude or atom whenever someone says atomicity or, you know, what makes them really great? In this case, for example, why not a transaction in a bank, for example, you know, is not lost? You know, you know there are, can be lots of failures. Okay, Basile? Uh, yeah, uh, hello. So, yeah, that was one thing I was uh, actually thinking about. Uh, so the thing with uh, relational, why uh, we would use relational database for our uh, one of the reasons could be that we need uh, an asset transaction. And so we mean by asset is, uh, as the first part would be atomicity, which is what you were just talking about, uh, which is we need the whole transaction to go through, uh, otherwise we need to be stopped. So for example, if if I sent me to somebody and it got money from me and it didn't reach that person, that transaction should be cancelled all in all. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that, uh, you know, the money is from me and it hasn't reached that person. Uh, and so if if we have a business requirement would uh, require such uh, things and especially uh, with, with data consistency, if we have to ensure uh, that the data is fully consistent, uh and that's the case when it, when we have data then then we would uh we would most likely go with uh we'd most likely go with a relational database as opposed to non-relational database where uh the schema is very flexible but uh we don't we don't get such assurances which make which uh, makes it very uh hard to implement uh, at when we have 
requirements. Hello everyone, he will be back. Yeah, he's having some little issue. Please be patient. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Yes, we are. Again, apologies. I think today we have uh, quite a connection issue in the office. So, okay, where were we? Um, not sure. So, redundant multiple copies by the DB server, shared availability. Uh, multiple users concurrently altering will not lead to unwanted inconsistent changes because of and then query reading is faster because there are only needed bits of info that we can pinpoint to faster i mean again these are very useful uh, specific language to alter our needs of the server i mean i think this is where you know whatever hussein was posting i think definitely um that's the key but so in um i think a lot of you probably have worked on mongodb uh, at least in, in week zero and you will be working also dynamo db or other non uh, relational databases and what do you think would require like you know from your understanding you know, what what decisions or what factors would influence your decision to use SQL versus no SQL, for example. Make it interactive. I mean, I think I'm, I'm not just here to lecture. So we are co-learning. Yeah, Yvonne? 
Uh, I think what would influence my decision whether to use SQL and NoSQL is the data itself. How scalable do I want it to be? The attributes of the data, do I need relational tables or do I just need data that can increase wherever and however? Also, I think what would would make me choose between the two is the speed because NoSQL is faster as compared to MySQL. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you won't, I think, you know, really exactly the case. Definitely the data structure um, influences the database. In particular, is it hierarchical? versus you know much more described naturally in a relational and then of course how big is it going to come and and that how big you know how many roles influence the database right so if it is really large um then managing in concurrency uh, redundancy for example as well as um so whether do you need all the nice things from relational versus you can live without it so i think those are factors for example when you design, when you, you saw that the, the Slack, for example, were much more in, in NoSQL format, right? So that's just even if they give you CSV, but these are different tables, not put in relational, but much more in non-relational way. And again, if you have Twitter, if you were to look at the Twitter data, that was again another one. Um, but a lot more important is, of course, how fast it's growing and the kind of the economics of it is also matters um, and hierarchical versus non-hierarchical means you know sometimes if you want uh, one you know one row for example it may one of the column might be in itself um, a table or a structure quite another structure in that form for example representing that's called one nf right so trying to um, the one NF, there are many NFs, right? Normal forms, but the first, the one NF dictates whether it's actually relational or non relational as well. So, whether the data can be stored with just only tables, and it is, of course, it can store anything, you know, from in a different form, like by trying to force it to be, for example, relational or a relational one, you can write it as no relational, right? So but it's still what is a natural form of it and um and do you have dependence around it that the consumers so for example sometimes you want to give of course sql everybody knows sql and therefore you might also it depends sometimes on thing but just only when we look at the data itself how the data is generated so for example you know bank data or transactional data is itself lending a lot more in a relational way um and so it's super easy in that sense but messaging for example is a lot more complex because there are different on one single item so it, it you either have to create uh, a lot more a wide table that means there are reactions different reactions and different people commenting on it replying trades all of that for example just breaks some of the relationality and it's suitable um suitably actually adopts any of these messaging things actually much more are on uh, NoSQL, for example. And I think the data size and the, the, how much updates that you require um, also, I mean, depends. Again, that one can be, but much more of is like, you know, how many you are expecting and, um, and its structure, the data structure dictates uh, that one. Okay, so we have um, flexibility of the database, true, but how do we, quant you know, what does it mean in actual term? Because as I said, almost always you can do whatever you want, right? But some are more natural and suitable as you go, and others are more if you decide, you know, even just how do you decide between MySQL and Postgres? Again, that is a dictation on how you want to store. So, for example, in Ten Academy, we use Postgres a lot because it we store many things as JSON, and that JSON conformant, that JSON is in itself you know, breaks one and F. And so you need databases that have a newer um, model. Right? So for that reasons, for example, we do that. Um, okay, so. Okay, so Hussein, do you maybe just 
what about now? Like, what are, what's your understanding in NoSQL and the relation between my data sets? That's true, Ikram. Um, yeah, it's one, but I would say it's much more of, I mean, it's um, the part for me for NoSQL use is just a lot more of it. There are dictations on yeah, on like if you don't want to define sometimes a very strict relational sense, then then and then when you expect how you generate the data, so if the data is being generated um, in in such a way that, for example, you have hierarchies, you know that the way that you design your your every you, you know whatever the data is for, if it is in a hierarchical sense and doesn't have uh, a true you have to repeat it for example you know to respect these different normal forms if you have to force it very much then it's probably a point where to see no as well um that means you know how are you generating the data and how are they related to each other and are they for example like a set of are they are is table you know is a natural form or for example json is a natural form so that basically would help you a lot more on on choosing you know whether that is again even within within the databases within relational which databases but also whether it is um, i think it is definitely people change uh, so again i'm responding to hussein's uh, question on a learning so his uh, statement learning process than a one-time de design absolutely I think even at some point you start relational and you go on and then you might learn at some point that you actually are increasing adding more features that makes it less relational and more suitable for um, no relation or no SQL. So in that case, um, yeah. So, and there are other factors. I mean, for me, for example, I mean, I'm sure there are some of you here who are better at actually database management, database of that, but in a practical terms, uh, the very essence that when I think of data models are how am I, you know, the first is just ideology, right? The ideology part of it is that in a data vault ideology, you, you know, you basically don't use that much of delete or puts. So if you just, if we talk in terms of API place, so whenever you think of delete or put, put means edits in just the HTML sense, you know, if you are modifying data and you don't keep the history of the data, then that part, for example, is uh, a lot more of it. It's one type of design, right? Where you're trying to mi minimize memory uh, and therefore you're kind of are basically whatever state, the state of the data is not kept. So that means you're changing the data and then you can't go back in history. So that I think in the old databases, almost always what you want the database to reflect is, you know, the state, the current state of um, that role. For example, if the person, you know, has changed their name from uh, because now or their, I don't know, location, you know, whether you actually keep the location history versus not. So whether you are, there is, it's called in the data vault sense, data vault has, you know, basically, you know the core principle is that you don't at all delete it's basically every everything is a data that means edit is a data so you can't delete a data um so the operation itself is a data right so what in, in that scenario that at any time you know from the just like a blockchain for example you will be able to know exactly the evolution of any single state from its in, in you know from its basically creation to the current state and in that scenario you only add even if you you use relational or no relational so basically uh, or not not no, no relational but no sql sql versus no sql in that sense you actually um you're actually um keeping history so the state of any edit any column any um entry is kept um, and so that's, for me, the way, you know, that understanding that we use in, for example, using the data vault. Because of that, it's slower, of course, like over time, 
um, a lot more of it is that you you have kept it and it, it grows and normally it's that analytic for analysis reasons you 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 would be able to know of course you will be able to determine um, and the other parts of data model is log models even the actually databases they work with log models so by log model you basically are logging everything and um so so you like you have like even just when you you know to respect of course in a database record whenever they say you know like even if power is cut off as long as it's in the log i think we will share also a blog on that as long as you have one um, log one truth where it's recorded it's a file system in linux is the same so then even if the you know it's not written later the the database synchronizes from that log to basically um, just the tables that you will be able to see so that synchronization component is um yeah the auditing process um yeah for auditing purpose i think i don't know if that was uh, for abdul Hamid for this reason uh, what i'm talking but it's absolutely necessary that log that file system so if you open actually databases you will see only files right a lot of just files here and files there it's just more very close to actually file systems so it's that's why i think understanding a little bit of how database works is also essential to to learn how um this thing beautiful thing that we see works okay so any question in that or any you know as i said i want the chit chat because the most important part from this tutorial i want you is to start thinking about it you know to start using like okay you know um how do I, for example, you're going to store a CSV. So you want to ask some questions so like, okay, how do I store? How do I decompose? You know, I, can I use now just one of them, the one NF? Can I understand in this sense? Or the two NF, like the second NF, the third NF? Like, you know, what do I understand by that? Just, just a little bit of this time and then next time. So you get better over time, but by asking and thinking and using it. Okay, Yvonne? I think I'm a bit confused, so let me try and clear my confusion. Yeah. So, uh, data warehouse is just a database. The difference between the two is the usage. Is that so correct? Kindly correct me. It, 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 so, the, simply, the simplest answer would be, yes, that's correct. The data warehouse is just a, a modern version of a database. But okay, thank you. Then there isn't the, you're welcome. The, but there isn't a clear like you, you know, we like to, of course, people are always companies are always pushing the boundary, right? So you def, the definition between database and data warehouse, if you go in the internet, there are many people who will give you different answers. Some might think you whether uh so instead of thinking of that, so they they explain what modern is. So by modern, it actually refers usually by compute and memory, right? So in the past, you know it, that both to scale, to increase, for example, your database usage, or you, you know, to increase more, more, uh, more rows in your database and to increase the database, you have to grow both, both the memory and the compute. So that means you have to add actual computer um, in, in your database, right? So that it, it has more space as well as more compute. In a modern sense, that part of compute and memory, that, that, that's what they call in the database, the compute part is basically the one that queries, you know, that adds and the, the part into the database, as well as when you query it, it gives you the data. And the memory part of it is where actually, of course, you store data. Now, in a modern data warehouse case, one of the most known one is an, um, what's called, um, oh, like, um, I think my memory is just, I'm just gonna, we, we've mentioned it, so. Um, uh, 
Snowflake, for example, is the most known now uh, within the data warehouse. And it's one of the biggest uh, valued company just doing on modern uh, part, as well as Google BigQuery and Amazon Redshift, for example, are another um, part. So, but if you just look at Snowflake, what it does um, is very much, it, it has, it actually, you pay even for your database in terms of how much computes. So it doesn't even, because memory is these days so cheap, because they decouple memory and uh, compute. So the only thing that you would pay, the only thing that you would pay is actually just then compute. So all of their pricing for a Snowflake is that how much computes do you need? So that means, you know, do you need one compute or two computes? And that, that means, one compute means, you know, basically one hour of compute. Uh, so it's they have the, the the compute unit. So that basically they define it in Amazon. For example, they have the smallest compute unit is it's called nano. So then they say one hour for in nano um, one CPU, you pay something, right? So they they actually made it very easy now to actually only think about how much access do you want the um, uh, your 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 data and that is what costs and everything else just memory whatever is so cheap that you don't pay for it that much, more or less right so but that decoupling is allowing them how they get the old database modeled into this new data warehouse is most people agree also just that compute very, you know distributed or decoupled computes and memory is what defines also database or versus database versus data warehouse so it's up to, you know how you look at it but in in effect what continues the old the database concept into the modern big data era is data warehouse so just data warehouse is the closest to database and then data lake is much more of object store the closest to object store and does that make sense Yvonne? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, lake versus warehouse versus vault versus actually there is now a lot more lake house. You know, a lot more the terminology is actually lake house, and and the lake. So, in the concept of so, for example, uh, so there is also not only lake. There is also actually um, what is it called. Um, swap or swamp so if you add so the 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 data lake concept came because you now are streaming from different places right so you really don't have you know you, you don't want to throw especially because now machine learning tools deep learning tools you know one of the key components of deep learning is that you don't need to too much to orchestrate the data or work on the data to extract and um, features because that you know deep learning actually will give you will learn the features itself so it's called representation it learns the right representation to your data by representation it means whether you you should give the data for example just a very simple description is that whether you give it as uh, you know a data that is about for example body health or um, you can give it uh, you know the height of the person the weight of the person and then you know you ask it whether this person is healthy or not right? and the age of the person or the other transformation of it it's a representation of it is that you do some formula then you you use bmi for example and then you actually then give the the person the age in the bmi and then you ask it whether the person is healthy or not so these are called different representations sometimes we call them feature engineering or feature transformation right but that part of it, deep learning as being hierarchical, it actually tries to learn in the first few layers. It actually is learning the, the right representation for the problem. In this case, health, the health of the person is now the kind of the key component, what you want to predict. So, you know, it learns whether it should do, you know, the kind of BMI or not. Of course, that's very simple. So that, you know, the example is very toy in this case. But in image, that's very different. Whether you give it the, you know, to, to detect faces, 
do you give it basically just every pixel or do you want to give it basically the age of uh, or the color of the the pictures you know things like that is not obvious so that's why usually you give just deep learning just the image itself but even instead of the image maybe not even you know image also comes actually from the camera some kind of transformation maybe if you give it the raw image it might learn even better right so that part of representation learning deep learning has popularized and that basically is the data lake concept so can we keep actually can we not do anything any transformation on the data can we store that data in such a way that you know we can you again use it reproduce it and that part becomes the lake and then but the, the problem with lake you know even if it was so popular and databrick another uh, big company that is actually very equivalent if you have heard about spark um, that's actually databrick databrick has an, an, another domain uh, snowflake is on the data warehouse and um uh, so even if it's snowflake even if it says of course data warehouse in itself they also give you data lake as part of layer so then when we come to kedro layer we will learn about this data layers but you know basically snowflakes actually is selling itself or its sales product as data warehouse while data brick is as data lake you know the data lake it's a representation of success in the data lake sense and that one is basically to be able to give you so to be able to query your data without putting them without working too much um and without putting them in a table so that means you can actually query an object store just like s3 and others like you basically be able to query that based on only metadata and structure so that means there are for example athena in aws sense or uh, parquets type of uh, files you store them and the structure itself will give you and then you you can actually query with them and the metadata table um in in kind of like hadoop hive or actually the in s3 again glue and these are basically the apache hive version and um so this using just metadata proper metadata to document your data so because if you don't have metadata and you just put everything in one folder you know it becomes you know your download folder for example most of the time you really don't like it because it just stores without any metadata so of course that becomes a data swap you know basically swamp is just more um it, it's useless but a proper data lake with a metadata actually is queryable that means there are many tools that actually may not be as fast as maybe sql but for more practical purposes especially for data science purposes you can actually query your your basically uh, data lake in that sense um you know that's the reason why data lake is because become popular because you don't have to do much in the beginning you can store as much data and it's endless and then you can query you can build on top of that then from that on you build basically marts data marts so you add for example for your feature store and others just after analysis uh, because compute is also getting cheap you can compute on top of them and add you know put them in a database for dashboarding and stuff a lot more i think if you see most of our um challenge we give you has inspiration from both and then recently there is also a much more popular version of it lake house it's basically combining exactly you form data warehouses but then you you actually have also a lake um for for your just source so the source you don't change it but on top of that source you build um you build basically your data warehouse which is much more faster and easier to understand for special non-technical people okay um so yeah so the whole idea of data lake is exactly working less on on data and working like you know just basically when you need them that you have a mechanism data bricks provides that for example that you can query the raw data um, but as you move, so in Kedro, you will learn. So Kedro is then um, from McKinsey, you know, just much more popularizing this as well and making sure that you have actually a very useful product at the end, right? So basically thinking data in terms of layer. Everybody talks in terms of layer, but, you know, that layer, sometimes they call it staging. So in, in for example, um, uh, 
snowflake type that in the data warehouses you have to stage somewhere your data before you actually add them into data warehouse because the data warehouse is ultimately you know a structured component just like a relational so before you add them to that you have a staging and, and all that so all of this concept became uh, in my opinion and i think we adopt that one as well in Tain academy kedro then gives you just a, a terminology that, and they have seven data layers in the first la layer is called raw data so that means nothing has changed from the source so it's basically representing the source and then the second layer is called um where you actually change only types so you basically to access to give metadata to it you have to type it and and then the third layer becomes primary that's where you start actually analyzing and then the third you know four set gives and ultimately even the dashboarding data actually the output of that will also be stored in that layer and then the seven layers they, they form seven layers we normally don't use all of the seven layers but it's important in that form of thinking so the, the data models of kedro is what we want you to adopt of course um because it, it it only specifies the structure you can use data warehouse databases data lakes it doesn't matter you know whether you use postgres or then you use S, s3 it has no um it is insensitive to that all it does is that you structure your data and you give them name and then every time you 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 ask where does it belong this data and the determination of like where it in that layer it belongs becomes actually did i process it and how much did i process it do i have the processing an automated system or not so if that is the case then you put it you know based on these decisions you actually put it in different layers and that way so you can have like in one kedro uh, framework you can have a postgres an a3 data lake and as well as also um you know a simple let's say uh, redis uh, or memory database so in, it, it can accommodate every type of it and and that's um yeah does that make sense what i'm talking or are people more confused do you have question does that in the first place do you get anything because you know in 10 academy you know it by now every hour you spend you must get something out of it and you you should be a little bit unhappy if you don't get much out of the one hour you spend because then you know every hour you know it it's worth a lot for you to finish your project so every interruption from that must be valuable and must must help um okay so be economical in your time because you don't have much to finish much of your project so um great okay so that's great abraham a bit confusion on kedro so maybe just can you uh, you know what confuses you or and i know you, we will introduce Kedro and I went a little bit ahead of it, but we can still clarify some things if you have questions. Abraham, do you want to ask for a question or just ponder about it? You know, what, what could be the confusion? Yeah, so the first part, Kedro provides a whole package, a Python package that you start managing. And basically it is, it allows you to label your data. So for example, let's, if we were to use Kedro for this current week, what, I mean, what we will ask is the first question is that, which one is my row? You know, row data means something that I don't produce. I don't have control, you know? And that part, you know, it's the one that you download or that I shared with you, that's your source. So then you label that one source. Then because it's a CSV, you need to type it. Typing means, you know, what is column one? Like, you know, the, the first column, is it integer? Is it, you know, floats? Is it string? Uh, so you basically have to type everything. And usually that you write, that means you have, you start creating metadata to it. That actually anyone can read, any other thing will be able to read. If you know exactly, you know, in a database, that's what you do, right? You, 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 
the schema helps you for the database, you know, for the, the query to return the right thing, right? Because in the process, the database, whatever engine does the conversion and all that for the storage, it, you know, to save memory, it probably saves it in a certain form, but because you have a schema, it reads that later, it, it loads that data and then changes into that schema, you know, based on that schema, it returns for you the right thing. You know, it's the same as in JSON. You know, JSON is popular because it almost always makes it super easy for, you know, stringify everything in a, in a serialize it. And, and then because of the schema, it's how it saves it, then ultimately you can transport in between serialization and deserialization. And that allows, you know, JSON to be the popular one for trans, you know, transport. The same is in database, of course, how it stores is might, can be very different to what it returns to you. But in between, given the schema you provided it, it actually knows how to convert it. And so something like that you must do, so that's for typing. So, you know, if you save then from the actual source, the actual source can come in, in a number of ways, in Excel, in CSV, in PDF, in whatever, whatever, whatever. But you must standardize them. So the standardization component helps you to actually query on top of that raw data or for the, the next generations. Uh, the next layers so that that part is there um, and then the third component on that standardized one so for example now the csv you convert them into you create a schema for them so the first column is string the second column is hours the second you know date whatever and then you basically be able to store that in a in a, either in a database whatever and that that one you can call it where you store it for example after standardization where you store it you can call it primary but primary, usually you have done some analysis. So for example, let's say you decided to do some small transformation on that. You, you want to decompose here and that. So that's called primary. So that your primary transform is basically the first one. And then from that on, so you store that one as well. So because it's a data vault concept, you don't delete. So you have to almost always go back, will be able to go back from one layer to where it comes, you know, from to the source. So you will be able to have, so that means you have a graph structure that helps you to know at any time, if you want to track the history of that data, you will be able to do. And the history of it is important because someone, if they are auditing your data, they will be able to know. Okay. Um, is that, does, is it making sense? Abraham, yeah. Go on, Abraham. So um, if something, yeah, if you are, okay, so I see the text. So this part, the Kedro part, we have a full tutorial on that. And there, not only that you will have a code, but you will have, um, you know, there will be a, a kind of a going through a demonstration. So this one, I wanted it to be just more, I think I am talking too much. Um, I didn't want to, but everyone is silent. What I wanted to have is a conversation and how you know, just much more like preparing you for the number of tutorials that are coming after this. Okay, so, but in part, yeah, it's it's a way of, um, you know, if you go to Kedro, um, you would be able to see this, what I'm saying, it's just a graph structure uh, of modeling the history of the data. Okay. With all history, you mean, I think the confusion is that data vault, is 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 a principle um, that stores the entire history, but the actual part of how you store it is different. And it, so, yeah. so all of this you might as separate different things. They are not. So whenever we think of Kedro, Kedro is reusing concepts from everywhere else and defines one. You know, some some company in this case, McKinsey AI team have outputted wrote a code uh, called Kedro, and with a certain data model concept, and their data model is data layers, but it incorporates data vault concepts, uh, star schema concept, whatever concept. It doesn't matter. So it's not like decoupling. If you are thinking of like, oh, I have to use Kedro versus I have to use this. 
that's not the case. It's just that there are all of this, and so these are concepts. And then, but when you go to practical things, you usually uh, it's one of that tool might contain a lot of these models built in. So it's not like you have to use one over the other. Like it's the conceptual framework of how do I model and why I, I should I should use this or I should do I should do this or I should do, not do that. Okay. So does that does that at least provide some? I mean, if it were a question and and not me not talking, but if there are interventions that it might have helped. So is that clear that it's not one Kedro versus Data Vault? It's more. Okay. Abraham, was that clear? Like, did I confuse you by data vault? Data vault is just one type of model where, you know, the, at the core is just storing data for data analysis. And on top of it, you much more in, in some areas, it's called the staging. Yeah, no, don't worry, Hussein. But Abraham, you asked you were some question that it seems confused. Is that clear now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's good. Like I think I like this. Like if it's not clear exactly, don't say it's clear. Uh, we try to clarify it as we go on. But if if more question, this particular question in your head, ask them so that we can uh, answer or at least discuss about it. Right. So. So the Hussein are the layers different transformed copies of the data. Yes. So in Kedro, basically everything starts the the basically the the, the real data starts from the row and everything is just transformations, joins. And, you know, if you if you have like 100 types of data sets, you can imagine the network will be, you know, you probably will join them, one of them and put them in a, in a kind of a database, the joined version so that you don't compute it later. That becomes one part of that network. So, yeah, it's a, a kind of a combined and... In all form of like that kind of transformed component. Everything from the row af after the row, it's a transformed uh, component in the k row sense. Um, which for Abraham? You mean so from the k row sense? Okay, yeah, let, let me, I think that's simple. It's just maybe it's much more um, easier. I'm just So let's look at just the different ones. I'm trying to choose one that has. So do you see my screen? I assume you do. If I okay, so so these are the different the seven layers, right? So row, intermediate, primary, feature, model input, models, model output, and reporting. Now, I'm talking only in the data engineering sense up to this point. 
where it's much more the three layers are the, the data engineering component. Then once you start, of course, EDA and business insight, then you go into you know, adding features. Feature stores comes here. And then even after feature stores, then the one, you know, this is much more of like the experimentation component of it, different features you think will be useful for the model, you store them on this layer. It's actually a labeling part. You know, it has nothing got to do with, a but it's like how you label your data and organize them. And then basically you will have a model input layer. So that means so that because you freeze, because you will be able to know whenever you have a model, then you can associate exactly which data, which input was used. And that is basically, but model itself is also data. Right, so the mo model itself is data, and so that every the layer, like the naming, it's a naming. It's not really there. There isn't much, like, in a way, it's not a folder, it's a folder, it's a folder. But it's much more labeling part, and by labeling part, then the model, the data itself, model data are stored in the model layer, and then the model output. Every time you do some prediction, that prediction is also data, because you you know later. So that part is called the model output. Okay. And then whenever you report about that and the uh, interactions in that reporting is stored in the reporting layer, okay? So that's basically kind of the seven, we call them layers because we can we like to think of them as layers, but actually they are tags or you can call them. Um, so is that clear? Abraham? Okay. So in this sense is, you know, it's almost always about thinking how to be, how to manage your data. I think earlier was was told, but without, of course, without knowing what in the future, you don't know what this data will be used. So you try to give a certain, you know, everybody is trying to come up with different modeling data models. And some of them are really deal about as I as said earlier, is about speed and accuracy. So in that sense, then you have this component, right? So this is the modern data warehouse. You have the data source and then the ingestion, storage, analysis, visualization, right? But there is another component uh, that also makes them traditional versus modern database, a data warehouse. So one of the things that you can think of is that a lot of the traditional one was on sites and nowadays it's cloud then about purpose so the purpose of the in the past it's very clear like what the purpose of that data was so it has a very specific decision making process but in in a modern sense we really data is oil so how you would use oil and how you it's very different so it's actually much more pragmatic on that so the processing of large amount of data in any form is becomes the modern the purpose and data source Usually in the past was just operational and transactional database because that's what the company does. But in the modern database, any data source, blogs, sensors, etc., you know, every other, you don't know what tomorrow you will integrate. The scope, a lot more of in the past was business intelligence. Now, even data is saleable, right? So you can sell your data. So that's basically, uh, that's, it's a varied one. Architecture wise, Normally, in the older way, is of course you you must have a very specific. I think last time it was, um, um, I think it was Hussein that that uh, mentioned whether you know the design is going to be evolving. Yes. So as you can see in the modern data science, we don't really usually try to think of structure as much. I mean, we start with structure, but what matters is of course as and the cost is of course lower. But so these are the different, all of the designs and data models are trying to handle the speed, cost, purpose, scope, and then, um, you know, basically scale, right? So the scalability, real-time analysis support, advanced analytics support. So that really means in these days, AI and all of that, robust security and governed access. That means if you want to sell your data, you want to be able to give only a certain part without um you know personal identifier information and all that so that kind of governed access uh, is important and then concurrency or simultaneous user support and flexibility to change tomorrow as well and collaboration and simplicity and resilience 
are the key components as well in the modern sense. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. Any question? So actually, I realized I was not sharing the the part. I was actually sharing this um, the traditional versus modern. You know, location is on site, cloud purpose specific processing, data source operational versus that scope business intelligence in the traditional sense. Now everything else, including data science, AI, architecture wise, you in the past, you have to choose one to, to start your data warehouse. Now you don't have to, you just add in the data lake sense, for example, then on top of that form different because memory and compute is very cheap. Um, and then the most important parts are the in the data, in the modern data warehouse, you, you have to address scalability, real-time analysis support, advanced analytics, robust security, governed access, simultaneous user support, flexibility, collaboration, simplicity, and resilience are uh, the, the key. So that was I was talking. Okay. So I think from my side, I think I talked too much, more than I wanted. But any question? Anything that... Okay, so, you know, from tomorrow on, you will have more practical one. I think mostly I try to prepare, you know, to just so that you can start thinking how to use each of the tutorials in your work. Like, it's not just only hearing, but to start critically thinking like, okay, you know, why do I have to do this? Or, you know, which model am I using? And, you know, do I understand this? Can I ask this question? I am trying to motivate that part, that curiosity of, you know, mixing both theory and practical. Of course, we focus more on practical once in a while, though we start discussing these models um, such that you understand as well, you know, the, the broader sense, as well as conversations we organize with other teams, actually working teams. It's to help you connect what you are doing in that week to actually when you go into become a member of a team, you, st you have to understand the general picture, okay? That's the reason. Okay, so let me stop there. And if there is any burning question, I can answer one or two, but if not, let's stop there. Wonderful, Ten Academy team, we can stop recording. Thanks everyone.